Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us on today's webinar, Playing Smart, Implementing Your Gamification Strategy. My name is Melissa, and I will be kicking things off for us today. Let's get started with some brief introductions. Our presenters today are David Wentworth, who is the Principal Learning Analyst here at Brandon Hall Group, and Isabel Wallace, who is the General Manager at Thinking Cap. Isabel has been with Thinking Cap since its inception in 2001 as general manager. Specializing in process and user experience, Isabel works with customers to onboard their training programs into the LMS. Her valuable insights in the delivery of unique and engaging training programs for associations like NCPA, corporations like Amazon, and nonprofit organizations like the British Council. Speak to Isabel about how to achieve 100% completion rates on your training. I would like to extend a thank you to Thinking Cap for sponsoring today's webinar. Thinking Cap is their logo and their ethos. There is science, magic, and just a bit of whimsy in their Thinking Cap, in us, and in their clients. Since they started in 2001, they have delivered superior learning management solutions to corporate, higher education, and not-for-profit clients on four continents. The results is that they have helped hundreds of thousands of learners expand their knowledge, skills, and expertise. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with Brandon Hall Group, we are a research and analyst firm that empowers excellence in organizations around the world through our research and tools. A quick mention that we currently have several certification programs open for enrollment, including our Certified Learning Strategist program. You can visit certification.brandonhall.com for more information on all programs. Your participation in our surveys is one of the most crucial components of our research. So if you have a few minutes to spare and see any topics on our list that you would like to take a survey for, it's always greatly appreciated. Links will be available in your handout, or you can always visit brandonhall.com and click on open surveys for the latest list. All participants do receive a piece of complimentary research once the results have been analyzed. And last, but certainly not least, a few logistics. To ask questions, we ask that you please use the questions panel on your control bar. Today's presentation is being recorded. We will share a link to the recording and a PDF of today's presentation via email in roughly 24 hours. The chat is also open for today, so we invite you to join in on today's discussion with our presenters. Share your thoughts as we go, or if you have a minute right now, just pop in, say hello, and let us know where you're joining in from today. If you would like to download a copy of today's presentation instantly, the link to do so will be available in the chat momentarily, and without any further delay, I'm going to turn things over to Dave so we can dive right in. Great, thanks so much, Melissa. And you know, as I uh, mentioned, we're going to talk a bit about uh, <clears throat> gamification today and some of the things that uh, <clears throat> are involved, some you know considerations and challenges and things to think about and why it's uh, so important that we start talking about um, games and gamification and the role they play uh, in the learning experience. So um, I'm happy to have Isabel with us today to uh, help us uh, walk through this and um, you know, we really look forward to any questions that you might have so please feel free to use the the question box or the chat um, we'll be keeping an eye on those to communicate with you today and um, yeah I'm just really looking forward to that so we're going to just jump right in I wanted to start off by sharing some of the recent um, data we've collected around where organizations are with this idea of gamification in their learning um, every year we do a human capital management outlook study where we get a pulse for what organizations are thinking about for the upcoming year uh, and for you know this year for the one that we did for 2022 um, we asked if companies were thinking about investing in gamification or not and uh, the majority of organizations do plan on investing somewhat in, in gamification for learning um, although only eight percent say it's going to be a very heavy investment still uh, overall 62 percent of companies are going to plan to make some sort of investment um, in, in gamification um, another thing we did uh, wanted to look at too was whether or not uh, the pandemic had an effect on the use of gamification because we know it definitely altered uh, the way that organizations uh, tend to use or look at uh, different types of learning modalities and technologies. And um, honestly, there really didn't seem to be a huge impact uh, on gamification. I, I think it's important to remember, you know, 
th this idea that we're talking about this the, the use of games and we'll get into more of the mechanics of what we mean by games and gamification but the use of these items and elements for um uh, for learning uh, it, it, it's it's a very specific use case, right? It's not something that you're going to apply to literally everything that you do. Not everything can be a game um, and, does, and, it, and it shouldn't. And so it, it represents, um, you know, a relatively small portion of the overall learning experience. But um, we do see that even though the majority of organizations figure they're going to do whatever they've been doing, um, if, you know, slightly more decide that they're going to do more um, use of, of gaming, you know, since the pandemic has has set in and then um just to sort of you know reiterate that point a little bit is that um you know we ask how frequently do you use the following modalities in your learning experiences you know the programs that you deliver and on a four or five point scale uh, a one to five point scale these are the organizations that gave these elements a four or a five meaning they use them um, regularly or, or consistently. And you can see about 12% of organizations say um, that they use uh, games um, to that degree, which is, you know, like I said, pretty expected. Um, it's not the same as everything being e-learning modules. So, um, but a big part of what we're going to talk about today, and Isabel, I'll have you come in and just say hi to folks here in a second. I think that's one of the things we're going to talk about is we need to get into a little bit of the difference between games right themselves the actual uh you know playable game and the elements of gamification applied to other elements of learning but you know looking at some of this data and and where where companies you know where their heads are with um games and gamification is that reflective of what you see with um prospects and clients that you work with um how does that line up so i would have to say that a lot more prospects are asking for gamification elements when they're switching between lms's now um that's mm -hmm. definitely become a lot more of a, a focus for them when they're picking i don't know if they're necessarily always ready to to jump straight into it a lot more um it would be nice and it's on our roadmap but it's not something we're doing yet um and mostly that's just because i think a lot of clients aren't really sure how to do it within an lms they're not sure what their options are and they're not sure how to implement or extend this one game module they may have into the rest of the uh the learning that they're doing so um a lot of a lot of the projects that we're doing now with onboarding is really helping people extend what they're doing in their activities so that they can implement it within their lms in a more immersive manner yeah yeah, and I think that's what we're trying to hope, you know, today is to help people think through this. If you're, if this is something that you're interested in, obviously, you know, you've tuned in today um, because you've got an interest in, the, in these ideas. We want to sort of help um, clear some of the air and, and um, talk through how this works and how you might implement it. Because I do believe that's that's something that holds organizations back from this is they're not sure um, how to use games or gamification and whether or not it's worth it, what's the value, and how do we do it right. So, and because of that, you know, you see you don't see very often um you know it's way down at the bottom here but that's literally we ask companies you know what tools are you using to deliver learning and few companies are using a dedicated gaming platform for learning and that you know is understandable as well because as you'll see as we talk through this these ideas that we're talking about um are probably more at home within the context of other larger modalities other tools other platforms like the lms or the lxp or something like that but um you know you, you get a sense that we're still um, in the nascent days of game games and gamification, but 57% of companies said they found that games are either uh, anywhere from moderately to extremely effective um, for, for learning. And, you know, Isabel and I today will hopefully talk through some of the reasons why they are effective and how to make them effective. Um, and then sort of wrapping up where things are going, we do see that companies plan to invest in games and gamification moving forward, we see 25% of companies that are looking to add um, investment in gaming, 33% uh, looking to add investment in badging, which is an element of gamification, and we'll get into that a little bit as well. Um, but, you know, sort of um, just looking back at all the research that we've done recently and just seeing that despite how often um, I end up talking one on one with companies that are doing this and having a lot of success, and we get a lot of um, in our awards program, we get a lot of submissions where organizations are doing these really cool things with games that are really driving um, engagement and helping people uh, retain the learning and apply it later. Um, you know, so that we see the potential there. And then I look at the overall data and I see that it's still um, a very slow move 
to using this more often. So hopefully we can help companies today make uh, make their way through that. So as we think through it, I, I think, as I mentioned at the beginning, I like to take almost a step back and, and say, okay, we hear the, a lot the words game, we hear gamification, we hear them used interchangeably quite a bit, which you know isn't that big of an issue, but it is important to understand what you're talking about when you're discussing this with learners, with uh, you know business leaders, people who you're trying to convince to make um, investment decisions. So I look at it like this, that there are, there are games, which are the actual games that somebody would play Right, so the uh, the employees would engage in an activity. They would launch some sort of game, whether it literally is um, arcade based or if it's more um, like like a word game or matching. But there is game play involved in the actual activity. Um, some sort of point and click interface. Perhaps you've got an avatar or a character that you have to get through um, a challenge, or you're just answering a series of questions, what have you. But the this being that the learning event itself is a game. Then there is the idea of gamification, where you're taking the things that people should probably already be doing from a learning perspective, right? You want people to be accessing this content. You want them to be answering questions about what they've learned correctly. You want them to be able to demonstrate a skill, right? These are the things that we're trying to do from learning um, uh, anyway. You can apply game mechanics to that, where you're giving points, awards, achievements, leveling people up based on the way that they're progressing uh, through their learning, the different things that they're achieving in that. And you're able to add this element of gamification, which provides a bit of a motivator, um, a bit of engagement, uh, a sense of reward. Um, and these things can, you know, as you define them separately, but they can work well um, together in the same environment as well. But, you know, again, Isabel, is this something that um, you see when, when you start to talk about games with organizations? Do you feel that this is still one of the big challenges is the difference between these two elements? I, I do. I do. I see, um, I see a lot of people almost overthinking in a way what it is that they were doing before, thinking they need to go in a different direction. And really, it's just a matter of rethinking what their original objective was and how they're doing it within their courses, but also figuring out what the overall gamification plan is, right? Because there should be an objective beyond. Um, and yes, if you're already designing good courses, you're already looking for these outcomes, you're already trying to achieve this anyway, so you're probably not too far off. Um, but from a gamification perspective, yeah, it's really extending what you should really be extending what you're already doing. Right. And you so stepping through now, it's I think, one of the things to keep in mind is this is not something completely unheard of, right? This is the kind of thing that's occurring for most people in their everyday lives or encountering some form of gamification, whether they realize it or not. It could be even the idea of, you know, uh, acquiring points at Starbucks or, you know, you, by purchasing, you know, obviously the motive for Starbucks is to get you to, to spend more and to get more marketing information on you and your and buying trends, but they're rewarding you with points that you can add, save up and use towards something. So they're rewarding the activity that they're trying to motivate, right? Um, you see it in, in um, almost any kind of app that you may use. There's, there's a gamification element to a lot of the things that we do on a daily basis. So it's not as though, you know, you're introducing some sort of foreign concept um, into learning, you're just trying to add this layer that uh, motivates uh, people to to do the things that you need them to do within this environment, and then reward them for that too, as well, if if possible. So we start to think about this, you know, the, the gaming that goes on, and including literal games. I mean, I, I always look at um, you know modern video games. You know, when people start to think of, well, you can't do games and learning; it's it's frivolous and it's sort of a waste of time, and we don't want to. You know, people are too busy as it is. We don't need little corny games to try to engage people. But the truth is, if you look at, say, modern video games, they are the embodiment of a really engaging learning experience. Like typically, um, a lot of them, they, they are online. So you're working in a group. Right? So you've got people working as a team to try to achieve an objective. And as they make their way through the objective, they, they have uh, successes and then they maybe have failures and have to go back up and start again from a certain point, learn and work ahead based on what they learned from that failure. Um, you know, very much uh, a learning experience. And, you know, we can sort of um, build on that within a learning experience. And so you look at the different types of game players there are. Um, and this is, you know, obviously very general, but there are different types of games that are built to uh, 
tap into these motivators in these different types of game players, right? So you've got your achievers. These are people that are uh, obsessive about collecting points, uh, about leveling up, um, you know, g- gaining those achievements, getting those badges, getting those ribbons, getting the awards, what have you. But then you've got people who are explorers, who um, their thrill is being able to discover new things within the, the environment, you know, if it's a game, um, and they want to do it their way and find things you know you look at um again looking at like a modern video game you an achiever can do this most of these games will have these bonus points that for doing certain things that will add up and you can trade those in for you know whether it's a power up or some uh, a, a new um skin on your character what have you or you can explore in the game and forget about the direct uh goal that you have you can actually go out and look around and do other things then you've actually got socializers and games now obviously have a huge social element. So a lot of these games, again, like I said, are online. Um, you're working in teams. People can communicate with each other. Some people really thrive on that aspect of the game. And then there are the straight up the fighters, the competitors, the people who are in the game to play. They want to, they love the competition. They like the leaderboards, they like to see themselves uh, on that leaderboard uh, and moving up, if not already at the top. Um, and, you know, Isabel, I was going to just say, you know, we, we talked about this earlier. Um, you had some thoughts and some of this kind of struck you um, from a learning perspective, though. What, what are your thoughts on, on being able to tap into these kinds of game player types from a learning perspective? Um, it, there are so many opportunities. It's, it's so much fun. Um, <laughs> so I would say from, uh, there are, I will, in my experience, um, with some clients, there's usually an emphasis on one over the other a little bit more. Like we have, um, we have one client where their audience is incredibly competitive. So tapping into that fighters group is, it's so easy. It's, it's like low hanging fruit. Um, the socializers, I find sometimes it's harder to tap into sometimes where you have a, an organization that doesn't want to have more online interaction and they get nervous about having more of the social elements. So sometimes that's a harder group to mm. work with. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, but yes, there's definitely so many ways to tap into these, to these groups, even if you don't have, uh, forums, but yeah, there are so many ways to, to tap into it and we can get into that a little bit more later on. Um, but, uh, but there's em- elements that you can use for all of these and they're, they're pretty simple. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think we'll touch on some of these elements and, you know, uh, Tan may ask a question here, um, just sort of level setting again, saying that, um, you know, gamify- this is what Tan may is saying is gamification can be considered a subset of games because it's not necessary that games might be related to the content. She's wondering if that's the case. And I would say, I mean, to a degree, that's probably true because technically you could have a, a game that's not necessarily related to the content. Although I think that kind of misses the point. It, it's it, it it's how games have been used in the past as sort of a, an engagement tool, like, right? hey, this is fun. This is interesting. Do this. Um, I, I think that that approach has, has a limited return um, because if you're going to spend the time and energy trying to engage your learners via a game, the game itself should be related to the content and actually be, um, you know, helping the, the learners uh, either tap into their knowledge of the topic or exhibit the skill that they need to exhibit um, to get through the game to, you know, to, to actually participate in the game. Um, so I, I think really, the, not necessarily a subset, I think game is something when you say just use the word game, I think of actually playing right whether it's a a drag and drop a word match a a literal video game where you've got a character who's jumping or running or what have you and then gamification is more about um what goes into something that already exists to add game mechanics like leveling and narrative and uh, narrative structure and actually we'll talk a little bit here um this uh some of the gamification elements um so these are the things that in, arise within gamification that need to be um, sort of fleshed out from a learning perspective, right? So the first thing is this idea of progress mechanics. So the fact that learners need to know that they are making progress. Everybody wants to know that the, the work that they're putting in, the effort that they're giving is is uh, resulting in something. So being able to display what the progress mechanics are, like showing that you've done this, you've gotten to this point, you've gotten this many points, you've gotten this badge, some sort of achievement level for, for folks. That's one, that's one element. Then this idea of a narrative, right? This thread that connects everything that, that isn't, so the 
the points and the, the badges don't just exist for no reason, that you can actually build a narrative that says, ties them all together, uh, that tells some sort of a story of, you know, here's why you want to move from point A to point B or eventually point Z. Um, then there's this idea of player control. Um, and this will vary obviously from environment to environment, but an indication that the, that the learner is actually has some control over what they're doing, where they're going, what's happening. Um, you know, this is important from a learning perspective. We've seen in our research how uh, impactful it is for learners to be uh, have at least some sort of autonomy over their learning, as well as the ability to see their progress. Um, so putting that uh, in is definitely um, a key gamification element. Um, we also see how important feedback is in the learning environment. People really want to know how uh, from their peers, they want to know from their coaches, mentors, managers, um, how they're doing, what's working. And so within the context of the learning, um, being able to know if they're doing the right thing or not, right? Um, if we're getting things wrong, um, it's important to know that that's happening and then why and how to remedy that. So um, game mechanics offer a lot of opportunity for that sort of immediate feedback um, of how to uh, retry and, and get better or seek out new information um, you know, to correct any mistakes. Um, of course, we talked a little bit about the social piece. So those opportunities for collaborative so problem solving, you know, organizations know that so much of the work that they do um, is done via teams. Um, and, you know, they know, so why shouldn't we be learning in that kind of environment, having people collaborate during a learning experience so that they're building those kinds of skills at the same time? Um, you know, and then along the same lines of those mechanics and the, and the progression is that scaffolded learning. So that increasing the challenge, um, you know, obviously if you've ever played a video game, as you go through each level, they each get a little bit more difficult because you're getting better at it, you're learning more. Um, and so the idea of scaffolding the learning, so you're easing people up and building towards something, um, those that mastery and that leveling up. And again, the, the, the social connection so people can share how they're doing and they can also share tips and tricks, right? Best practices, here's what helped me, here's how I learned. These are all elements that are you find in games that are super helpful for engaging learners, helping them retain, helping them move ahead, helping them progress. Um, so yeah, and Isabel, you know, some of the thoughts you you have when you work with companies around games, you know, what are some of the key elements either from this list or, or others um, that you focus on? Um, I would say most of, of what we focus on is, is this combined with making sure that people complete. <laughs> so it's whatever method we can get to help people get to not just um, complete, but also retain the knowledge. So um, we use in different contexts, we use pretty much all of these um, and, and then some um, wherever we can fill in the gaps to help, uh, to help encourage people to come back and learn everything they need to learn and more. Got it. Um so then, um, you know, we wanted to talk about some of the elements in a little more detail, and there are several um, different ones, but I think one of the, the most common ones that people experience first when they start to think about games, and maybe it hasn't even really thought about it from a gaming perspective, but the idea of points, right? And it seems very simple, but um, it's a great way to start, and it actually has uh, a lot of value. Maybe as well, just take us through some of the ideas around points and how they work and what they mean for gamification. Certainly. So different different systems that you're using will have different options, but um, the the approach that uh, that we prefer to uh, to recommend is one where you take a look at what your objectives are, your learning objectives are, um, and hierarchically sort of categorize what the results are that you're looking for. Whether you're looking to build specific skills or or make sure that people retain certain knowledge, or if you're building certain traits in in your audience. So if you're learners, if you're trying to build leaders, then you're looking more for sort of leadership traits, right? Um, mm -hmm. And if you're if you're looking to teach a specific job role and and or a specific skill, so try to separate those out and categorize them. Um, and then when you're um, completing activities or, or such, 
look at the activity and see how would that translate back? If someone were to complete that activity, how would that translate back to each of those types of points? Um, so we do spend a lot of time at the beginning of our onboarding process, sort of analyzing and looking at the, the content that we have, the objectives, identifying where new content may need to be created even, um, and uh, and analyzing them and, and rewarding the uh, the completions with specific point values that make sense for that subject. So say they're completing a course on um, on how to use a phone system, right? As a really mm -hmm. basic one there. Um, then then the what the points are is really specific to that skill. So you don't want to give a general. You've got five learning points for completing this thing. It might be 0.5 learning points for taking this one part of this one bigger picture thing. But it's 0.5 points of of um, of customer service. Right. So, mm -hmm. so really taking a look at the points and analyzing them and breaking them down based on what the sort of traits are is a much better use of points instead of just an overall general point system. Um, because then it also gives you more analytics options to determine, well, you know what, this person, they both have, these two people have 500 points each. Great. That's fantastic. But this one is really strong in their leadership points. And this one's really strong in this skill, but they may not be the same thing. So how you um, communicate and how you target those, um, those different learners will be different based on the sort of points uh, breakdown that they have. So mm -hmm. definitely I, I recommend that. Um, and also um, points are something you can give in small doses. So whether it's a small micro learning activity, they may get a smaller number of points, but they'll get the points right away. So ideally, wherever you can, I, I do recommend trying to break down the activities you have so that you can give the points in smaller increments. Um, and so they can see them increase faster, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, we uh, earlier on in in uh, in that survey that you were, that you were talking about, you mentioned that a lot of people are using LMSs and very few people are using gaming systems. Um, sometimes you can reuse um, if an LMS supports credits, you can reuse credits as a way to break down your points system. You just may not be giving specific credits with a with a regulatory agency. It might just be that you know this is what I'm calling my credits, and this is the credit system that I'm using. So it's a good way to to potentially reuse something that's already in your LMS without having to go somewhere else for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's sort of the, the the best thing is you know depending on what your environment is, points are whatever you want them to be. Um, mm -hmm. It's 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 the idea of what is it that your audience um, may be interested in and different, it might not be the whole organization, different audiences within the organization may respond to different incentives. Um, so, you know, being able to uh, create a system that rewards um, relevant uh, outcomes for, for, for people so that the, there's alignment because the idea, you know, one of the tricky things about gamification, it's when people, uh, and to reuse a word is game the system, right? If, 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 you, you want to be sure that the ultimate outcome isn't just the points, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the goal of the learning isn't simply to, to gather points. The goal has to be whatever the ultimate outcome of that training program is, you know, so for that um, phone system uh, training, it's not just to accumulate the points, it's to be able to use that system uh, effectively. And so just being sure that we're motivating and rewarding the right behaviors so people aren't just focused solely uh, on the points. Um, the the next thing that is very probably the, the the second most common thing people come across from a gaming standpoint is the idea of badges and there are a lot of different systems out there that are badging systems whether they're closed loop badging systems that work internally or open badging systems where people can you know win badges and take them with them uh, if they move to different organizations or different uh, areas um, but the idea of something that represents um, the achievement so talk a little bit more about this. Uh, certainly. So, um, so badges are a great resource, um, mostly because they add a sort of a visual texture to, to instead of just a standard point system. So from a learner perspective, they all remember going to, to girl guides or scouts or something like that when they're younger and they, and they understand what a badge is, which really helps initially. Um, we highly recommend using an open system, um, like we have SCORM for our courses. Open Badge is a great open system for, um, for documenting your badges and, and awarding them, um, mostly because they can be shared easily, which I mentioned a little bit later on, but they can be shared easily. But they're also everything that about what they did to get there is, is baked right into the badge itself. So um, there's a record of it. You can move from one, um, one system to another and everybody knows what it is. Um, so, um, so I highly recommend um, using the Open Badge system wherever you can. Um, and I think there are um, beyond um, beyond whatever. If your LMS doesn't support that, there are probably other systems out there that uh, that do open badge support as well. 
Um, I do like the fact that uh, with badges, you're really achieving something. So I, um, so I personally, when I'm using badges, I use them to, uh, to help motivate someone to complete. Like once you complete this thing, you will be awarded a badge. Um, and I like to, um, I like to ideally theme them. So whatever narrative you're using within the course, extend that out to the badge as well. So if, if it's a Harry Potter themed course, then it'll be a Harry Potter themed badge. Um, so things like that. Um, also badges can expire and it doesn't come up very often in gamification, but sometimes when you're learning um, a skill or something that the, the length of the knowledge, like how long that knowledge is good for, um, especially comes up a lot, for, a lot more for us in tech, where just because you knew something about computers today, doesn't mean two years, two years from now, that knowledge is still going to be applicable. So um, the other good thing about badges is that they can expire, meaning you've awarded this badge, you've been given it for this year, but next year, you should probably retake this thing because you're going to need to, uh, to maintain that badge. Um, so all of those things I, I find really valuable. Um, and again, sharing, um, if your program is not just about trying to get people to complete some, some training that they need if they're employees or something, but maybe you're selling training, um, badges can also be sort of a double benefit in that they can help you market your program as well. So as soon as someone's shared it to LinkedIn, um, then people see, oh, that's a, that's a badge for doing something. I should, uh, it looks interesting. Maybe I should try go follow that back through and, and see what it was for. So I do really recommend that. Um, and then I'm not sure what other systems are supporting with regardings to how they award badges, but they don't just have to be for um, completing an activity. So we've extended our system so that you can uh, reward people for doing certain actions that go beyond it, whether it's posting in discussion forums or it's um, achieving a certain number of points in a certain area. So say you were looking at those leadership people and you wanted to make sure that someone's well-rounded and they've received you know, five points in this area, five points in that area, and so on and so forth, you could give um, badges for that as well. So really just defining what your check-in points are for each of the different objectives you have for your overall gamification program um, and using the badges to as, as different indicators that someone reach those check-in points so the uh the next element then um with badges and points typically end up pointing toward uh this idea of a, a leaderboard so showing people you know with the points they've got and um, where they rank and, and how that goes and so using this as a motivator sometimes um so let's, let's dig into a little bit of this and and I, you know if anybody has used any of these or has any uh, experience with you know some of these um either you know not even as a, a learning professional but like maybe you've um, been a part of something that uses you know points leaderboards feel free to share your experiences in the uh, in the chat so um we've used leaderboards quite a few times um again with our more competitive audience um they're kind of a must um my preference isn't always to show just where the learner level is at but really also to show where a team's level is at so for me when i'm looking at using um when I'm looking at using a leaderboard, it's not just how this one person is doing with all of their points that will reach the super high competitive ones. But if you want to try to bring in, I mentioned earlier, it's sometimes harder to bring in the more social people. Um, building a team and building that camaraderie of like our team is going to do better than your team. So say you've got your you're teaching salespeople, you've got East Coast versus West Coast kind of thing. Um, you building that competitiveness between those two groups is easier because then um, there's more camaraderie with the people within those groups to help the anyone who may be struggling or helping you encourage those people who are struggling to to fill in the gaps and and build the points overall. So for me, when I'm using leaderboards, it it is a great way to reach that really highly competitive audience. But um, but try to incorporate teams wherever you can. Um, and then I also, I don't ever just show the top of a leaderboard, um, because yes, showing the top is this person at the top, but if you've got a really large audience, you, you're never going to see, um, all the people at the top, sort of like if you're doing the Peloton, I, I would never be at the top of a Peloton group, but, but they show me where I'm at within the Peloton group. Um, so I, I would find that sort of mechanic, um, from a leaderboard perspective, very helpful, um, and also, um, whenever you're showing them, it's super easy to just include a little message below saying, you know, some tips on how to improve your ranking. Um, and I do find that that helpful. It gives instant sort of um, instructions or help or tips to to guide people in, in how to improve where they're at within the board. And I think you'll find not just the competitive people, but someone else might might be interested to find out what what are they missing? How come these other people are all the way up at 500 points and I'm at 50? Mm -hmm. So I, I do find I do find that helpful, too. 
Yeah, I, that's one of the things we do hear back um, from organizations is it's, it can be tricky. Make sure you understand your audience. And you, know, you mentioned here a sales team, right? So there's a group that's typically motivated and, and this idea of leaderboards creates that healthy competition. But there is that danger of, of demotivation. You know, if somebody doesn't get in the top section of the leaderboard, they may feel like, well, I'm never going to make the top of the leaderboard. So I don't care anymore. And I don't, I'm not going to bother. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a question of making sure that you've got the audience right or using the, the lead board in, in uh, conjunction with something else, right? So it's not solely about where you appear in the lead board. So um, yeah. it's, it's again, it's a, one of the, all of these, um, these elements serve a specific purpose and they're not um, the right call in every situation, but they can be very useful um, in specific circumstances for sure. And I would say if you, if your system doesn't support leaderboards, um, if you're getting reports and results from the system on, on how people are doing within certain activities, there's no reason why you couldn't send out a weekly notice on, on those as well. Um, that, uh, that could also help motivate people, but it gives you a chance to craft like, and this group is doing this, maybe you need to do this to, to help boost whatever. It gives you a chance to add some more feedback as well, but, but yeah, it doesn't always have to be an automated leaderboard if, if that's difficult for your, for your group. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So you you also wanted to bring in the, the um, tie this to certificates, which um, you know I, I think this is a, a great uh, element. You, you know, I just have this uh, anecdotal um, story of, a, of an organization that presented at one of our conferences, and they presented their learning program, and it was they had won an award for this program that they put together. And one of the outcomes they had said, well, you know, we had um, high eighty percent completion rates it was a, it was a, it was a relatively challenging program but they had high 80s 80s you know 87 80 percent completion rate and they were trying to think well how do we get that a little higher and they, they said literally they allowed the learners to print out a certificate that said they had finished and they saw completion rates go up into the low 90s um mm -hmm. just that one act alone was enough to motivate just enough people to say you know what i, I want to finish this i want to get that and I just thought that was an interesting example of, you know, what this can play, but talk a little bit more about certificates. Certainly. So um, there are different levels of what I would say is a certificate. There's the official certificate. You finish this program and it's not just a certificate of completion. Um, it's, it's the official, got the signature, got the seal, got the, the credits and, and such that you've awarded. There's that level. Then there's a certificate of completion. And I think anytime you're using a certificate of completion, there's, there's room to move. There's room to, uh, to add some more interesting and fun, motivating elements to it. So it could be anything from just even just down to the level of the text that you use within it um, and bringing in the narrative, whatever game it was. So yeah, so if you're if you're going with a Harry Potter theme, why not a Harry, Harry Potter looking certificate of completion? Not a difficult thing to do. Um, but also there's no reason why that certificate has to be one page. That certificate could be multiple pages where the first one is your certificate of completion and the next one is tips for you know, what to do next. And the next part is maybe a coupon for a free coffee or something. So depending on what it is you wanted to include, um, think of your certificate as like this empty document that you can fill at the end of someone getting a course that, that does anything you need it to do. It can, it can tell them motivating things. It could be, um, it could be, you know, not just you've completed this thing, but it could be, um, a, an additional chance to communicate with the learner to help motivate them in other ways. Yeah. Um, another thing that, that comes up and a lot of this has to do with, um, you know, when you're giving points and badges and certificates, the idea that you're mm -hmm. recognizing and you're rewarding learning. And you know, we saw in um, our research, we did a study on upskilling and reskilling, and it was focused on the personalization of learning. And we tried to find um, elements that, you know, we looked at two groups of people in the study. We had organizations that said that their learning um, was having, uh, uh, was preparing them for the future of work. Um, versus companies that said, well, what we're doing right now isn't really preparing us very well. So you've got these two distinct groups. And then we tried to see what they were doing differently from one another. And one of the standouts was these organizations that said our learning approach is having, you know, has positioned us well. Um, they were much more likely to say that they provided some sort of reward and or recognition for learning. Um, that they were, you know, if, by if you finish this program, whatever it was, they were offering some sort of reward, some sort of recognition. Um, and so it was interesting to see that the, that was one of the key standout elements. But talk a little bit more about the ideas behind, you know, rewards and recognition for learning. So uh, 
we ask a lot of our learners, sometimes we're, we're putting them in front of a computer room and making them take these courses and there are essential things that they have to do while they start their job or essential things they have to do every year to come back and do their job. So really if someone excels or even just they take the time to actually do the training, um, giving them a chance to be rewarded or recognized for doing that or doing that exceptionally well is I think something that needs to be um, baked into every single gamification program wherever possible. And it can be as manual or as automated as you need it to be. Um, so, I mean, I think the, the gold egg for me is if you can have an integration with some sort of rewards um, reward system, I think that would be fantastic. Um, not everyone has that obviously, but, um, but there are systems out there that you can uh, connect to that automatically op give them options to pick amongst you know, maybe a gym membership or Amazon prime or something like that. So there are definitely options around that. Um, but I would say that um, if you're looking for um, rewards and recognition, even just sending announcements out saying, you know, once you say you're doing an annual certification and you can say, just wanted to call out, you know, these 10 people were the first to finish. Thanks for finishing so quickly. Or these few people got the highest scores. Those are also fantastic. Um, so I do highly recommend um, that from, um, from that perspective to, uh, to keep with the, um, to keep presenting that information in any way you can. And I mentioned it a little bit on, on the previous slide about certificates, adding a second page to give a, a rewards. I mean, it can be as basic as uh, the first five people get, you know, the first, the, the best parking spots in your office, or it could be that, you know, the first five people to complete, get a free coffee or something, anything like that, in which case they're anxious to get to complete, to get to their certificate, to see if they got it, you know, um, any of those things that you can do, I think are, are fantastic. Um, and also a simple one that almost every LMS will have is a completion notification. So there's absolutely no reason why you can't send that completion notification to them and, and their boss saying, hey, this person actually completed this course, which is great. And they did it quickly or they did it within X number of days. Anytime you have an automated notification like that, I would I would definitely use it if, whenever possible. Okay. And just checking to make sure that we have Dave back. Yeah. Is, it, is it Okay. Awesome. Uh -huh. So, yeah, so um, if you want to keep sharing, I'll go, go ahead, but um, so looking at, um, the, you know, the next step beyond uh, the rewards and recognition, um, we want to talk a little bit about, you know, showing progress, right? And, um, you know, we talk, we've already touched on this a few times in different ways, but I think um, what's important is that uh, it, it really is key that people want to know um that they are making progress. And a lot of this, you know, even you go back to the rewards and recognition, the points, the, the, the badges, everything. It's something that comes up a lot in the bigger picture around learning that, we, that I've been talking about a lot lately is that people just want the, the what's in it for me. It's, it's very important element of the learning experience. And if we want to build engagement and have people engage in the learning and be able to retain it, they simply just want to know what's in it for me. And I don't mean that in a negative sense, right? It's about, um, look, I'm going to give you my time and energy. Why? Make sure that I know why it's important, what's going to come of it, and then show me that I'm I'm making progress, right? It's a big key. It's one of the key elements of that, what's in it for me. And, you know, we found that almost all organizations in our research said that learners require more frequent feedback um, in, their, in their learning progression. So they want to know how they're doing and where they're going. And you can build that in uh, via gamification. So Isabel, talk a little more about that too. Certainly. Um, so I'm a big proponent in, in showing progress in many different ways, but really targeting what the goal is as well. So um, any e-learning course, although unfortunately a lot of uh, authoring tools don't support it, but there is, um, not to get too technical, CMI progress measure, um, which a course should send to the LMS that tells us exactly the percentage complete of that course. I wish they all did, but they don't. Um, so that would be fantastic if uh, if more of them can do that. Um, but beyond that, wherever you can, um, showing the progress of how they're doing with either within that one activity or within the group of activities, or even within the overall program is great. We have, um, we have one client, um, where they have, uh, volunteers that come in and as the progression of all the things they have to do, there's a standard set of things they have to do. So on every single page, wherever they are in that learner view, they can see a, a in essence, a progress bar of how they are until they're approved 
volunteers for the, for their organization. So visualizing like the larger goals and not just the, the, the small moments as well, both are important, but ideally when you're looking at the, the bigger picture, sometimes it's hard, it's harder to see that and harder to visualize that. So anywhere you can, if you can show that larger progression, like maybe someone's a new employee and it's going to take three weeks for them to, to be, you know, ready to, to, to hit the ground running. Sometimes you just need to show, you know, this is the three weeks you're on week two of three, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so that sort of thing is, is really helpful. Also, it doesn't mean those progress bars have to be boring. Um, <laughs> whenever possible, I highly recommend, um, bringing that theme back in. So whatever your narrative is for your, for your games, whatever your overall, um, goal is, there's no reason why your don't, your donut chart doesn't have to be an interesting donut chart or your progress bar doesn't have to be a, a boring old progress bar. It depends on really bringing the theme of what your, your game or your gamification program is and bringing that back into, uh, in, into the way that you're, you're presenting those, uh, those options as well. Yeah. And yeah, if any time you can get that to when they get to 100% doing something like animating it, um, like we had a, a client who wanted to make their progress bar look like a wand. And when you got to 100% complete, it would, the wand would wave and something would happen on the page. Um, I think that's great. So anywhere you can do things like that, I do it <laughs> wherever yeah. possible, do it. <laughs> yep. Melody, who's on, on the call today, says that uh, even for a single e-learning, they had a progress bar in that. But then yeah. for a course that had a bunch of different elements, it's nice to have that update in the LMS. So as you're picking off mm -hmm. these various elements of an overall program, you get to see sort of where you are. So uh, yes, I appreciate you sharing that, Melody. And you know, my my one piece of advice on the progress bar, and maybe everyone else can, or a lot of people can agree with me on this, if you've ever seen sort of software progress bars for downloading or installation, um, make sure that it's accurate and doesn't uh, get up to 99% and then take just as long to get that last 1% because uh, you're gonna, that gets back into the demotivation uh, category. Um, but most of the tools that are built into these uh, platforms uh, are quite accurate from this progress standpoint. Uh, and if see. you can pick an authoring tool that supports the my progress measure, <laughs> wherever yeah. possible. Yeah, and they're quite, one of the, the question that came in actually, and I was saving it for sort of the Q&A because I think it's a bigger picture question. So I think I will still save it's coming in, but it was asking about some of the tools for creating some of these things. So we will get to that question in the Q&A, uh, I promise. Sure. Um, another thing that you can do from a, an achievement standpoint is unlocking things. And I think that's like another way of describing sort of this, this uh, motivation for people. So what are some of the things you can provide from an unlocking perspective? So the easiest when you're working with an LMS is prerequisites. Um, sometimes you you really do have a prerequisite where you need them to finish the first thing in order to move on to the next. That doesn't mean you can't entice them with whatever that next thing is or encourage them to, you know, there's a secret thing that you get to do next, but you don't know what it is yet. So prerequisites are great, um, a great um, feature to use when, when trying to implement an unlocking strategy, um, especially if you're using a bigger picture thing where you have to go from one to two to three to four and, and so on and so forth. So you, so prerequisites is a great way to, to do that. It also is a way to communicate what you have to do in order to unlock this thing as well. So um, typically an LMS where there's a prerequisite will tell you what they have to do first. Um, so as long as you can present that in a, in a slightly funner way, then, you know, in order to learn this system, you have to learn this other system first, um, can be presented in a much more fun way, but, but prerequisites is a great way to manage unlocking. Um, auto enrollment as well. So when you determine that someone is at a certain level, there's no reason why you can't, when you're doing your, your enrollments into activities, say you have now reached a, a junior leader role. Therefore, we have enrolled you into these three activities as a new junior, junior leader. We've now unlocked these activities for you. Um, so definitely auto enrollment um, is a great way to handle that. And different systems have different options for their enrollment. So it would really depend on, on what system you're using, but, but it's a great way to manage um, unlocking. Also, coupons or passwords. Um, we use uh, coupons sometimes to, um, to give free access to an activity. There's no reason why that can't be used as an unlocking mechanism as well um, and considered more of a password in a way than a coupon. So it's a great way to say, you know, this is an activity. Um, and uh, and once you complete this thing, we're going to give you a password to go to uh, unlock it for you as well. And mm -hmm. yeah, anytime you're using an unlocking uh, mechanism, uh, mechanic, any system at all, whichever one you're using, just make sure that, uh, that you always tell people what they need to do in order to unlock it, because it's one thing to dangle this thing in front of them. It's another thing to not tell them what they need to do in order to, to unlock it. Yeah. 
right then then it becomes uh, a game in and of itself which is uh, a separate activity so um oh and trisha wanted to share something on unlocking uh, so i'm going to share this to the group if you haven't seen it in the chat folks but um just mentioning that trisha says that they use the unlocking feature when they wanted to create a specific learning path so every each of the modules was locked and then they unlocked as you know like you said the previous one was completed um and she was actually surprised at how much of a motivator um, that that would be when they would get in there and they would see sort of the grayed out module titles, right? You can't touch this yet because they're, but they're there and they can see them. Um, and then it was a real motivator to get people to move ahead and unlock so they could get in and see each one of them become, you know, uh, active and no, and no longer grayed out. So yeah, a great example. I appreciate that, Trisha. Thank you. Um, one of the cases, okay, so we got a couple more here. Um, this is interesting too, I think, you know, as, as a gamification element is notifications. We've seen, you know, for a long time now, the idea of, of push notifications as a tool for learning, like, um, and, and how effective they can be just a quick little, hey, you've got this new thing to check out. And, um, you know, this is rolling out or you're coming up on time to be due for this. Um, but these push notifications work really well, but you can also incorporate them into um, gamification as well. So let's see what some of these are. So um, we have a lot of organizations that use notifications as a way to help encourage completion, just right off the bat, no matter what, if you're, it's sort of a necessary evil in a way, if you, if you're working on a compliance program, you have to get to hundred percent complete, um, a, a really good use of notifications and how you manage the recipients and, and the frequency and such is, is a, is sort of a necessary step in, in reaching that, that hundred percent compliance. If you, um, if you're using gamification and if you have any sense of humor at all, please use notifications in a slightly more creative way, um, depending on how you're uh, managing the enrollment notification or how you're managing it with, like we just discussed right now about unlocking, like, Hey, you've reached a certain level, like, or you're at a job level of this, where we've decided to unlock this new activity for you is much more fun than getting a notification saying you now have to do this activity. So um, really think about how you're wording your notifications, whether it is a push notification or an email notification, or even a text message uh, version of a notification, no matter what the, uh, no matter what the tool you're using, just try to make sure that the message is concise and in a more positive sort of encouraging way. Um, I also really do like to use notifications on the larger program. So yes, if you were um, using Learning Pass, I like to include notifications on the Learning Pass to help say, you know, it's week two and you should be at this point in week two. If you're having trouble, let us know. If you're not, you're already ahead, good on you, you know, whatever those messages are, try to keep them at the learning path level as well, just to help um, keep people motivated to continue to, to complete and remind them what they're going to get at the end once they have completed. Um, I also do find that, uh, especially when you're getting toward the end of the cycle. So if you think that it's going to take 30 days to complete a learning path or an activity, and, and there are some people who seem to be struggling, um, and some of the later notifications, putting in hints, um, you know, you, you seem to be having trouble, you've had this activity for a while and you haven't, you haven't got past this point, maybe what we should do is give you a hint, you know, and this hint is this, and maybe it's a teaser to, to something that they need to do in order to unlock or something, but I, ideally try to, uh, try to embellish those reminders with, with anything that you think will help them move on and unblock them as well. Um, and also competition. There's no reason why you can't put in some of these reminder notifications, you know, just to remind you, you need to finish this thing because the other team have 90% completion. You guys are at 80% completion. So um, bringing the competitive element into the notifications are fantastic. Um, and I can't say it enough. Anytime you're working with gamification, theme it. Um, so whatever your overall theme is from one activity to another, um, try to include that narrative into your into your notifications as well. And a good question from uh, from Gwen: um, ideas for reaching learners that don't have email addresses, so notifications might not work. And so my first take on that is, um, and and again, this is also uh, depends on your audience, but if they uh, have mobile device access. Um, mm -hmm. can push notifications to their mobile device and that's either literally to their phone number or if it's through a uh, an app if there if there's a, a learning platform that you're using um, that has a mobile app um, that should be able to push out notifications as well any any app that's you know uh, on your phone has capability to, to push out notifications and so being able to do that from this standpoint you know from a gaming platform, whether it's an LMS, whatever, or an LXP, whatever you're using, uh, tapping into that notification um, 
tool to push those out. So if you have workers who are deskless and maybe don't have email addresses, um, perhaps they have access to their own mobile device or a company mobile device that they can get notifications on. Um, I'm not sure how else you might do it if, without those two things. If it's no mobile device and no email address, but um, there, there are probably other ways. And, and what are your thoughts? No. Um, I have, I've done a few projects um, where the email address was an issue, whether the organization didn't have their email address, but they had a phone number um, or in regions where, um, where it's just people don't have data on their phone. Um, mm -hmm. So they'll receive text messages instead. So, I mean, we've done projects um, that deliver training in India and what we noticed with there was that the SMS was way higher, um, the, the results and in, in sending the, the through that method was was much higher option, so ended up switching that whole program so that by default all of those all of those notifications went out by by text message, um, which is an, another great way to deliver that content. Great, thank you. And um, last couple here, learning paths. Uh, you know, there's obviously most people on the call are going to be familiar with the idea of learning paths, but the fact is you can use the concept of a learning path um, to bake in some gamification. So talk about how those two things go hand in hand. Certainly. So I, I personally love learning paths because it's a way to bring the game into the LMS. So you don't, so all of your, all of the work to build these games doesn't have to be in one giant module of, of e-learning. It can be broken up into smaller pieces and, and reused from one learning path to another. I know that a lot of authoring tools, it's all just one giant go. It's like bringing back the original plan where you could have reusable objects and, and use them in different training, whether it's in a, in a, a junior level learning path that might be use the same and then add on to it um, in a more advanced learning path. So I personally love the use of learning paths for many, many reasons and that being one of them. I also like that it's a great way to um, to help visualize the progression through that that bigger goal. So if your goal is um, everything you need to know to be an employee at an organization, then that is your learning path, right? So it means that when they come in and when they finish, they can see everything they have to do, um, and it's a great way to visualize that for them. So so for me, yes, it it dictates the larger goal. It shows them the progression. Um, and it gives you a chance to extend that theme again outside of each of those those modules or the courses that you have inside the the learning path, whether it is a course or maybe it's an outside um, activity or or an ILT or something like that. It, it gives you a chance to bring that in um, into the LMS through the learning path and and give you much more granular reporting on it. Um, it also means that you can give different hints at different points. So depending on how you're grouping your activities within the learning path, so you may have um, you know, week one, week two, week three, or it might be um, beginner, um, intermediate, and advanced sections within your learning path. Depending on how you're breaking it up, it gives you a chance to add hints and 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 given different points to uh, reward them on on items as well. So yeah, we have clients that do either badging on the smaller activities or badging on the overall learning paths. It, it, again, it gives you those sorts of flexible options. Yeah, this is a great way to sort of bring everything all together, all the things that we sort of talked about um, mm -hmm. and, and stitch it together. And that that um, uh, that theme, you know, we saw earlier in the game mechanics, the idea of a narrative is, is really powerful uh, in, in these uh, environments. Um, then we, you've got this, you know, adding a scavenger hunt, which I think most people are familiar with what that is, but uh, within a learning program, what are your takeaways here? So we talked about the um, the type of learner that looks to uh, discover and, and explore, and um, I can tell you that we're using this uh, this option with our own LMS, with our own training, even because we for us the objective is to get people to learn as much about our system as possible when they become our customers. So we um, we have a scavenger hunt set up so that as you work your way through the different courses on how to use our LMS, you get tips and hints on uh, on where the next clue could be found. Um, and that's somewhere else, somewhere within this self-discoverable um, collection of activities. So really, once you figured out what all the, your key activities, so if you have 100 activities and you know that, you know, to be an LMS administrator, there's five that you really want them to take or 10 you want them to really take. You identify which ones those are, and then you build the order with which you want them to do them. And then you're you're figuring out what the clues are and such. It is so easy to do because all you're doing is at the end of the activity, thank you for completing this. This is the hint. This is your mm -hmm. clue for, for the next activity. And it could be either right at the end of the activity or it could be in the completion notification for the activity, however you want to do it. But it's a great way to help 
um, sort of add a level of dis- self-discovery in a, in a more interesting way than just going to a page and, and skimming through all the list of activities, just kind of boring way to do it. Um, mm-hmm. So it helps encourage people to, you know, go find the answer to the clue. It, it engages them with the content in another way. Um, and it, and it helps them explore through content that, uh, that they may not have found otherwise. Yeah. And then the last piece is just overall in general, the, the idea of the learner experience, which has been a lot of, uh, thought, uh, around what makes the learner experience, but at least from this gaming experience, you know, the idea of how do we bring this all into that experience? And I think this is where all the pieces really do come together. And I, and I want to make sure that when people are designing these programs, that they think about this. Everything that the learner does from the start of their journey all the way through to, to completing all of their training and, and, and knowing everything, you know, ideally, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. everything about that experience should follow the same narrative, should follow the same goals, follow this, this cohesive structure. So when you're looking at your learning experience, everything about the colors you use, the wording you use, the language everything about it should be cohesive. So everything from using um, a theme to your marquees, uh, so the the image that you're using for your activities to advertise the activities or, or to indicate which activity is which, coming up with a theme for those images, that's super easy. Um, the resources, um, making sure that you're attaching your resources that are in a themed way, um, making sure that, uh, that any features that you put on your homepage are really follow the same sort of theme. Progress bars, I can't see enough. Everything that you see on the screen is really just, really just scratching the surface on the sorts of things that I think people can do with their learner experience to help make sure that they they follow the same theme. I had um, I had one client that went with a I've mentioned a couple of times a Harry Potter theme, where they came in and they combined it all so that even just right on the homepage you could see whether you are a Muggle or a professor. Um, from every level, depending on how you did on everything and presented, you know, because you're at this level, you should do this next because you're at that level, you should do that next. And if you want to try the scavenger hunt, try it over here. Um, anything you can do to, to bring that straight into the learning experience and extend it throughout like the look of the, the, uh, and the wording and everything that you do within it. And for fun, if you can change the footer content, add an Easter egg, just why not? Yeah. Cause that'll get around. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Now, this is all so great. And you can see, I think, when you look at uh, everything, you've seen how all of this stuff builds upon it, one another, right? This isn't like, do all of these things right now. It's all of these elements feed into each other, and you can use them in multiple different ways. But the idea that, you know, points can then translate into badges, which can then translate into leaderboards, which, you know, then you can create uh, scaffolding and then some unlocking and then a scavenger hunt that builds to the unlocking. You can, all these elements, you know, again, are um, build upon one another. And it's just about creating the, the right experience for your audience, for the content that you're trying to deliver, right? Does it line up with the skill and the behavior that you're trying to get people to uh, acquire? You know, if there's alignment there, that's even uh, even better. Um, so you can see the key takeaways here. It's in the deck for, for those of you um, who, you know, have are going to download the deck or you'll get, you'll get a, a link to it um, after the webinar as well. Um, but um, Isabel, the question that came in, and if you want to open the, your Q&A on, on yours, because it went away for me when I lost the webinar earlier, but the, the question was around um, uh, authoring, authoring. Tool. Yeah. So if you don't have a tool that has it built in, was, is that the question? Like, what do you do if you don't necessarily have a one of those tools? Or if you have a specific question in front of you, maybe you could Sure. Uh, so the question was, is there a course authoring software uh, which offers options for interactions with gamification already built in? So right. any, in my opinion, any um, any course authoring tool that supports SCORM 2004 should support interactions, which means that the potential is there for it to be able to do any kind of gamification you want. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that there are there are simple ways to do it, and there are more complex ways to do it. Um, I was at uh, a great conference um, for gamification where p- someone had used Articulate, uh, and they did a fantastic uh, scenario based game uh, using that tool. So um, if you can do it in Articulate, you should be able to do it. Um, though Articulate doesn't support progress measure, <laughs> but it mm-hmm. does support uh, it does support interactions, which is great. Um, so I, I do believe that uh, Articulate. We'll definitely do that. Some of the other ones, um, I would assume the same sort of thing. If if there are interactions, you should be able to. Um, there are add-ons to some of them that uh, where people have really prepped that and made it a little easier to author with that that might be worth looking at. But um, but I, I I've seen some great examples out of out of just out of the box tools um, that people have used. Yeah. And and don't forget, it doesn't have to be 
a full game tool. I mean, you could right. have um, you, you could have something simple like a tic tac toe or or a Jeopardy style game that is a great way to deliver a quiz. You know, um, mm -hmm. anything like that 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 you can that you can bake into these these courses would be great. But but also, I mean, I I've also at these conferences I've seen people use an ILT to deliver um, an in person um, card game that mm -hmm. did yeah. phenomenally well. So yeah. There, there's yeah. a lot can be done. And, and if you're looking at gamification, then you've already got your creative hat on already, which is great. Um, and, and it doesn't have to cost a fortune as long as you're, you're thinking about what you're really trying to get out of, out of the, uh, out of the game. Yeah. I, I think that, that, that example of the in-person, I think is great because as you know, companies get back into more in-person um, learning, because obviously it went away for a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. As we get back into that, you know, really rethinking, well, how do we do it? Because now we're realizing we can do so much of this other stuff virtually, online, on demand, what have you. How do we really maximize the time that we've got when we have people together? And these games are, and simulations are a real great way to, to leverage that together time um, and really make the most of it. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind when you're putting those together as well. Um, I know we've gone a little over the hour. We've answered the questions. I did have a quick question, though, I think, as well, that might be on people's minds. Um, you know, you, you can do this in almost any technology environment. But one of the things I think about is how how uh, important is something like the idea of XAPI to this kind of environment? The idea that I've got this publishing standard that I can publish the, the game to or the, the, the module to XAPI so that I can track what happens inside the games. Okay, you may have asked me exactly the wrong question. <laughs> okay. Just because, um, I, so I'm I'm old school. I um, yeah. I've been using SCORM for so long now that I've delved into the SCORM 2004 standard, and there's so much in there that people aren't using that's already there and it's yeah. already standard. So honestly, um, instead of going investing a ton of money on on getting into a system that supports XAPI, your LMS is probably already supporting 2004. And if it does, then that's, that's pretty much all you need. Don't don't invest the extra money in something else. I, I, I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, there I've asked many people, what is the scenario and what they want to use X, XAPI for? And mm -hmm. when they start explaining it to me, I'm like, but you understand that SCORM 2004 already does interactions already gives you tons of information about interactions, but in a codified way that the LMS and the course and your reporting will already be able to report on. It's just a matter of making sure that the courses are sending those, those interactions. So really it's just, I, I would look at more how you're publishing your courses and what level of detail is being sent to the LMS um, yep. and in what format. But yeah, yep. I, I think I'd start there and then see if, um, if SCORM, isn't enough for you if you need, really do need to go X API. Yeah. Um, I could talk for hours on that. So. <laughs> no, but that's that's great feedback. <laughs> that, I think when, it's, it's great feedback because when people hear about some new thing that they want to inject into the learning experience, they think, okay, well, this isn't uh, a test grade. It's not a completion. Do I now need some extra thing to track? And I think your feedback mm -hmm. is really great that nine times out of 10, you probably don't. Um, you know, yeah. This is stuff you can do uh, in the current environment. So I appreciate that feedback a lot. We did get a late question in. I'm sorry. I know it's it's well over, but we still have people on. So I want to sure. uh, make sure we talk to them. But um, Gorm is asking, do, you find, do we find that games or gamification is challenging with a multi-generational population? Do older people get engaged by this form of content delivery? And my first interaction is, yes, they do. I think we ascribe a, a little too much uh, weight to generational differences. Clearly, they, they, they pop up uh, in, in for certain things. I don't think this is one of those places unless you get too um, uh, clever or sophisticated with the way you're building your game and you maybe are looking at maybe a, a a newer game mechanic or something that's really pointed at a certain generation like millennials or what have you, um, then you might be an issue. But the idea of achievement leveling all these game of case, those are not generational. Those are um, focused on human intrinsic and sometimes extrinsic motivators. Um, I don't know, but in, in practice, uh, Isabel, since you, you were folks, do you, do you see this come up at all as a generational issue? Um, I don't really see it come up mostly because um, to solve one problem, you're, you're kind of solving the other. Like I would say um, you want to keep your interface as simple as possible because the younger generation will be annoyed by having a lot of other stuff in the way and the older generation may just, that's too much. Um, so generally I always try to keep my interfaces and my experiences as simple as possible mm -hmm. um, and, and take away. And if there's something that they don't need to see, remove it. If there's something that they don't need to know, remove it. Um, 
and that generally solves the problem of both of both of what they're looking for anyway. So yeah, I haven't really experienced that per se. Okay. Well, I appreciate that perspective. Thank you. Um, and I hope everyone got some uh, some tidbits out of this. There was a lot of elements involved there. And again, it's not, it wasn't a list of things that you have to go out and complete uh, all together all at once. It's just a whole bunch of different things you can think about and they all work together very well. Um, you can use them in different ways uh, and create, you know, different uh, experiences by combining them and using them in different ways. So a lot of potential here. Um, and not, not not all of it requires some sort of new um, and, and complex technology investment. It's really just thinking about what you've got and how to utilize it and then uh, going from there. So, um, Isabel, thanks so much for all of your insights and input. I really appreciate the work you did here and the time you spent with us. And, of course, thanks to Thinking Cap for giving you uh, to us and uh, supporting the hour. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you on another webinar. Thank you.